Welcome back to Scarlet Sprites, everyone, where real stuff happens. As an arcade goer in the 90s, you had a few companies that you could really rely on to bring you the best in gaming. The stuff that really could only be experienced in an arcade. And Midway was one of those big time players during that era. Now sure, a lot of these titles would be poured at home, but nothing really captured the same feeling as going head to head in person, four versus four with something like NBA Jam. The same could be said for battling it out in Mortal Kombat. There's just something about the communal aspect that made experiencing the best gaming had to offer an even more memorable experience in the arcade setting. And Midway would crank out a number of hits during that decade. I've already mentioned one of their most prolific titles, NBA Jam. Now that's a franchise that would even see a few sequels. Personally, I own Tournament Edition, also the revitalized and arguably better Maximum Hang Time sequel, and also the final true installment in the series, NBA Showtime. And while we're looking at Showtime here, oh yeah, Midway had this other little series called NFL Blitz an over-the-top arcade take on NFL football, which I'm sure most of you are all very familiar with. As a side note, NFL Blitz 2000 Gold and NBA Showtime 2000 Gold would be the final two arcade releases of these two franchises, so it's pretty cool to have both of those represented here in one cabinet. Oh, and Midway also put out this awesome hockey game called Open Ice. I'll never forget walking into the arcade and seeing it for the very first time. Hockey had long been my favorite sport, and seeing it come to life in the style of NBA Jam was a dream come true. Given the timing of this game, there are some unbelievably killer duos here. Iconic, would-be Hall of Famers that you can pair up together, and this is when hockey was really hockey. So we have basketball, football, and hockey. Where is Midway's baseball game? Well, as it turns out, and as I'm sure many of you know by now, Midway did indeed develop an MLB jam of sorts. It was tested in the Chicago area like many of Midway's games. It went through several iterations, including a version using trackballs that was then replaced with one using joysticks. Alan Noon, who worked on this, gives a great rundown of his history working on the game and basically says that the trackballs were wearing out every few days, and so they made the move to joysticks instead. It sounds like that didn't work out so well either, and the game eventually had to be scrapped. It's funny because this past summer I saw that one of the cabinets for this had been found in a group that I follow. I was really intrigued, and here we are just a few months later, and the actual game code has been pushed out for people to play on MAME. But emulation and MAME isn't really what we do here on this channel. This is a pretty big arcade story, but I didn't want to just rehash news for you. I wanted to have something real to show, something that you can put your hands on or that I can put my hands on and show you. So I decided that I'd get Midway's Lost Game Power Up Baseball running on original hardware in an arcade cabinet. So first things first here, I was thrilled that someone else had this idea and had already done the hard work and documentation piece for it. There are directions for putting this together online and I'll link that in the description. Because Midway was working with incredible technologies on this, it's the latter's trackball centric hardware that was used to run Power Up Baseball. These boards are incredibly common since many Golden Tees and even a few other games run on this specific hardware. To be sure though, you want a donor board that has 1083 Revision 2 stamped on it. So this is where the actual work comes in. You have to take off all the Golden Tee graphics, sound, and program chips, and then one U88 chip. These are all marked, and if this isn't your first rodeo, you won't have any issues at all identifying what needs to come off the board. Now it's time to get burning, or if you were like me, erasing. You've got 25 new EEPROMs to write, so you better have some time set aside. Maybe get your taxes out and do those while you're babysitting this entire process. The bulk of the load here are graphics and sound chips that need burned, and 
Fortunately for me, I had a decent stash of the 27C801 chips from all the Midway Wolf boards I worked on this past year. So, yep, just burning away. The next part of the process requires you to short some of the connections on the board as well as open others. And this means desoldering and soldering. I think it's best to handle this before you put your newly burned chips back on the board. It gives you just a little bit more clearance in some of the areas, but it's probably negligible for most people. Again, the instructions call out exactly what needs shorted, but conveniently, the board itself also tells you which pads to short based on the size of the chips that you're using. I'll level with you, this isn't Voltar soldering class, so don't judge me here. I'm adequate enough to get this job done, and I suspect most who have done some successful basic soldering will be just fine with this. I simply made small solder blobs to short each of these connections. The one thing you will want to check once completed, however, is that you have continuity from one point to the next on your graphics and sound traces. Just because it looks good doesn't necessarily mean you shorted the pad, and I might be speaking from experience here, so touch your points up and make sure you get that beep on your multimeter. Once you're good on your pads, go ahead and populate your board with those 25 chips you just spent an entire afternoon burning. With all that done, well, yeah, you're ready to rock. You're now the proud owner of Midway's Power Up Baseball prototype on original hardware. So with this being a trackball game, I didn't have a trackball in my arcade arsenal, so I had to suck it up and buy one. And these haps aren't cheap. They run about 70 bucks. Could have gotten something used, but I really didn't feel like cleaning out someone else's hand grime from crevices on this thing. Quite honestly, I'd rather chisel another dead rat out of an arcade machine. So, okay, I bought this trackball just so I could play this damn game, and yeah, it seems like there is yet another connector needed to now hook this up to the actual board. Fantastic. So I spent another $15 to buy this cable from Twisted Quarter, and now finally I have what I need to control Power Up Baseball. I'm also going to use this Atlas adapter from JNX, which I thankfully already had on hand. This goes right onto the JAMA edge and gives me easy access to the kick buttons on the control panel. It's just way easier than rewiring this stuff for different boards, but yeah, as you can tell by now, this is starting to be a pain in the ass just to play power up baseball. Starting to get a little edgy here. Okay, well, here we go, and thankfully, after all this is said and done, we throw the switch, it actually turns on. Take this moment in, people. This is Midway's Power Up Baseball, a piece of arcade history that was nearly lost running on original hardware on an arcade machine as intended. I know, it's not a Midway cab, it's a candy cab. I get it, Fuck you, they like baseball in Japan too. I'll jump into the service menu, but there's not a ton to show here. The most amusing thing I found was that you could change the speech rating from something G-rated to PG-rated. The sound samples for the sound ROMs are also interesting too. There's a jam sandwich, Whippy. He brings some cheese. The fabulous hawk. Finally, I'll switch this into free play mode so that I don't have to credit feed this while playing. So yeah, at this point, I'm just going to level with you. I'm not gonna waste your time. The game isn't great. And I wanna be absolutely clear, this is an unfinished game. It's a prototype. So we don't know what could have been had this continued to have been worked on. But as it stands, I really am having trouble seeing how people are comparing this to being on the same level as NBA Jam. Again, we don't know what could have been, but this unfinished version feels really unfinished. Spinning the trackball to throw pitches is awesome, and that makes total sense. It's probably the best use of the trackball in the game. Using it to bat, however, while having to hold down the second base or home button, that really sucks and feels completely awkward. 
Further, I don't know why you need to hold down a button to control a low or high swing when spinning the trackball up, down, left, or right will control the type of pitch when you're on defense. Couldn't you just spin the trackball up for high and spin it down for a low swing? Regardless, using this for swinging a bat at all is just weird. What's really bad though? Fielding. Spinning the damn trackball to move fielders around in the outfield is just brutal. I didn't see anything in the options to increase sensitivity, so you really gotta roll this bitch in order to make the fielders move around. After having played this for 20 minutes, there was no doubt in my mind as to why this game was eventually scrapped. It's just a pain in the ass to play. I know I keep repeating this, but I really want to stress that this isn't a reflection of anyone who worked on the game or Midway in general, of course. It's just a prototype that really needed a lot more work in order to develop into a solid game. My guess is they realized just how much work was needed and felt it best to move on to other projects. Given that, it's still amazing that we even have a playable version at all, and it's definitely cool to have a sneak peek into something that never quite was. So with all that said, creating this game to run on original hardware is a fun hobby project and something that's worth your time if you're interested in video game history, arcade prototypes, or are just a Midway fan. If you're none of those things though, it is safe to say you can probably skip this and feel comfortable knowing that you're really not missing out on all that much. So that's today's video. I hope that you found this somewhat interesting and learned from my mistake here. Don't overcommit or invest in prototype games or you might find yourself just a little disappointed. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will catch you all next time. Later, guys.